coming up on the Ultimate Health Podcast. You can't change people and convince people to care about the climate or to care about food or care about diet by using fear as a tactic. We've tried that for years with the climate debate. And, you know, fear only creates a polarization in two different groups. And it forces people to sort of squint their eyes and look away. What we need is to figure out what is the method that you get people to open their eyes and discover on their own. And the way that you do that, that we've learned, is through affinity. They have to fall in love with something. They have to see it through a different lens. And once they love it, they begin to want to protect it because they value the context, the reasons that it exists. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 370. I'm Jesse Chappis, and I'm here to take your health to the next level. Each week, I'll bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, I have husband and wife duo John and Molly Chester on the show. John Chester is an Emmy-winning director and has been a filmmaker and television director for the last 25 years. His latest project, The Biggest Little Farm, is a feature-length film that chronicles the epic eight-year story of Apricot Lane Farms, the regenerative farm he and his wife Molly started back in 2011. Molly Chester is an author, farmer, and chef known for her culinary work with traditional food techniques. She authored the popular traditional foods blog, Organic Spark, which became the inspiration for her traditional foods cookbook, Back to Butter. Molly's culinary journey led her and her husband John to start Apricot Lane Farms, a 214-acre biodynamic farm in Moore Park, California, with the goal of producing the most healthy, flavorful, and nutrient-dense food possible. John and Molly first got on my radar one night when I was looking for a movie on Apple TV for my wife and I to watch, and I was browsing around and I noticed at the top where the featured films are, there was an Editor's Choice movie titled The Biggest Little Farm. And this intrigued me, I clicked on it, we ended up watching the trailer, and the trailer was incredible. So that night we ended up watching the documentary and loved it. So I've been following John and Molly's journey since then. Really love the work they're doing. And it was awesome getting a chance to talk to them. Highlights include the world of regenerative agriculture, how animal input is needed to create healthy soil systems, coming face to face with grief, the nutrient density of food, and finding peace in nature. So much great stuff in this one. We had a really fantastic conversation. I know you're going to love it. And I'd really appreciate it if you could help spread the word and share it with somebody in your life. And I thank you ahead of time. Without further ado, here I go with John and Molly Chester. John, Molly, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, we got a lot to get into. You guys have been through quite the journey over the last number of years, last decade or so. I'm just curious, what's going on on the farm today? Anything unusual or anything, you know, out of the typical? Well, we've had some really, really hot weather lately, so we've been balancing that. Let's see, we're almost going into our fall crops, which will be apples, persimmons, figs, pomegranates. And um, other than that, I don't know, it's fairly business as usual this week. We were actually commenting on that yesterday, uh, how it's like kind of low key and feeling good (laughs) this week. It's the beginning of or the fire season has started Yeah, a lot earlier than normal. Uh, there was like these lightning storms not too far from the farm, but like, it, well, far enough, but it started quite a few wildfires in Southern California, as well as Northern California. So that's the season for us has started a lot sooner. The wind season hasn't started. That's in October. But, you know, we're just kind of coming, coming to the end of our super busy season, anticipating our wind and fire season. Well, let's take this all the way back to the beginning of the journey and talk about how all this got started. And I know that all begins with a promise you guys made to a dog. So talk <laughs> about Todd and how you first encountered him. So I was, uh, I was shooting um, a pilot for a series for Animal Planet about animal hoarders. And this woman had, uh, I don't know, 200, 300 dogs in a house, and Todd was one of them. And towards the end of my sort of month of going back and forth to this woman's house, I asked her if I could take at least one dog off her hands because they were all about to be confiscated. She kind of uh, gave a lot of pushback, a lot of resistance, and I eventually convinced her to release Todd to me. And the next day, the I guess the local... Um, animal. Animal something. Right, yeah. Somebody, they came and they took all of her dogs. 
I think they euthanized about 50% of them. Um, so Todd was a rescue from that situation. And we knew he had been bounced around before being sort of trapped by this order. And we made a promise. We're like, look, we're not going to give up on this little guy. No matter what happens, you know, we're going to be the last home he ever knows. And he was like really unique and special from like, go. He just would stare you right in the eye. And it was clear that he had that border collie intelligence where his vocabulary was a bit more expansive than most dogs. He kind of led the show. But as soon as we started leaving the house to do other things and left him behind, he went berserk and would bark incessantly. And that was really the beginning of our search for like a new way of living. And it really made this dream that we had been talking about for so long seem like an actual solution that we could blame on the dog and not on our own sort of selfish desire to be farmers. So at the time, John, you're a cameraman and you're traveling the world. So you're away quite a bit. And Molly, you're actually doing some blogging and you're a chef. So first, let's talk to you, Molly, about how this all got started for you. Where did your passion for food come in? I was kind of a little abnormal from a very, very young age in that when I was, I don't know, like nine, 10, maybe late elementary, middle school, when my mom would make my lunch, I remember telling her, mom, it's okay, I'm going to make my lunch today. Because my mom was one that, you know, she would cook meals at home, and we would sit around the table, but it was the 80s. So there was like kudos bars and Cheetos and little packs of things that felt like you were being a good mom. But somehow, then I knew that whenever I ate that stuff, I didn't feel good. And whenever I went out, and I would chop up my own salads and my own little olives and put them in a little container. And then whenever I took that, I felt better. So I made a connection really early that there was something about what you ate affected how you felt. And then whenever I was later in life, I think actually the 9, 10 age was when I decided I wanted to be a vegetarian. The lunch packing might have been a little later, like high school. <laughs> but anyways, I at 9 or 10, I decided I wanted to be a vegetarian. And I then was that until 27 or so. And I, in doing that, that was the era of like the soy everything. So I ate all of these different things. And, and I was kind of an unhealthy vegetarian because I didn't know how to do it. And my health declined. And so then in my 20s, it was this journey of trying to figure out how to bring that back. And I learned so much. And that's when I was introduced into concepts of kind of ancestral food and traditional foods. and really looking to the wisdom of what was and not forgetting that while you're in the present trying to make for a better future. And so, um, yeah, it, that learning journey, I also saw my mom in my early 20s heal some sinus issues she had had forever with a change in diet. She used a diet called the body ecology diet to heal that. And it was just like mind opening to me that that stuff can have that effect. So but it wasn't until culinary school that I really started to connect that the choices that a farmer makes can affect the amount of nutrition that you have in the kitchen to then be able to focus on nutrient density through soaking and sprouting and fermenting and all of these processes to increase digestion that you can do all sorts of stuff like that in the kitchen. But if you don't start off with food that has nutrient density in it, that it's not going to do anything for you. So it was a long journey to then deciding I think we might need to grow or raise our own chickens to be able to, to have the right kind of eggs. And those conversations John and I had and trying to find food for my clients that, you know, was the type of food we wanted to represent and then not finding all of the foods. There are good farmers, but out here for sure. But maybe we wanted a few other things. You mentioned there your health declining. What kind of challenges did you face? I actually um, landed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is essentially like a blood sugar imbalance. And there's different forms of it. Some can be weight gain. Mine wasn't. I've always been very thin. So it was kind of um, hard to find that. But also, I actually, in that, I also lost energy. I was so tired all the time and just lots of different blood sugar related things. But I finally found a good doctor in my mid 20s who taught me because I was eating all organic and things. And, but she taught me about sugars and just that, you know, even fruit sugars can affect you whenever you've got these kind of challenges and taught me that I really did have a soy allergy. And so I took out the soy. That's why we, our eggs are still soy free. Um, also just cause maybe the chicken shouldn't have that much soy in their science either, but, um, yeah, so 
I took out the soy and really got my my um, sugars regulated. And I actually was able to get my monthly cycles in check within a month or two, and they maintain consistency forever. So then even in my own body, I saw that, you know, you make these changes, food is magic. And it's not the only answer that I know now, there's so many things that go into finding true health, but it's certainly a piece of the puzzle. So we talked about Todd and his barking issue and that being a catalyst for making this big shift in your life. When you guys were starting to really get serious and talk about starting the farm, was one of you, you know, a little bit more into it than the other? Did somebody take more convincing? We both were into it, but I would say that I was the one that was more concerned that the idealistic level of our vision might not be attainable. Because once you venture into this world of regenerative ag, you you know, and or for our example, biodynamics, it can sometimes be less based in science and more on a lens and a perspective that sort of connects you and awakens you to these opportunities that exist for like this mutualistic relationship with your ecosystem. And there's so there's not like a roadmap to this stuff. And so I think for me, that was that was the thing where I wanted to believe it was possible, but I always kind of questioned whether or not we were going to uh, fail because there weren't a lot of other people around us, especially in like the region that we're in that believed in organics, let alone regenerative or biodynamics. So you didn't have like a community of support. They were always going, well, I don't know if that's going to work. And, you know, every idea we had essentially was, well, I don't know if that's going to work. Can't feed the world with that way of farming. So I think I was probably the one that was more the antagonist, at least in our, our twosome here. And when people were being negative and saying you can't feed the world with this kind of farming, was this other farmers in your area or yeah. was this other family and friends? Both. I mean, family and friends had zero understanding of what we were doing. They still don't understand really what we're doing, <laughs> at least my family. Um, but I think it's more like the local farming community would say those things to us, you know. And, you know, the reality, the response to that question of you can't feed the world with this way of farming is that no farm is feeding the world with any way of farming. The question is whether or not the industrialized way of agriculture will feed the world for the future. Because not only is it not even near sustainable, but it is an extractive method that is destroying the finite natural resources that will make available the opportunity to farm at all on this planet. And so those are things that aren't really well understood, but they're these words and these questions that farming community sort of asks of each other when one tries to break from the 85-year history or so of dominating nature through, you know, industrialized, chemicalized methodologies. Um, so it's this big unknown. And so usually these questions have really, they're the wrong questions to even ask. Is it economically viable? Can you feed the world with this way of farming? All these things essentially are to confuse people unintentionally from even exploring the possibilities that it have existed on this planet for billions of years that only in the last 85 years we've lost touch with. That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And we've thrown out so many different terms here. And I think it's important before we move forward to keep us all on the same page. We talk about what industrial farming is and regenerative ag and permaculture, organic farming. Let's define some of these terms so we're, we're all, you know, seeing eye to eye. Well, so the, the industrialized model is typically one where you're uh, growing a monocrop and you're uh, looking at soil is really nothing more than a medium with which to hold the plant up. You're going to give that plant everything it needs. You're not going to use, you know, the evolved relationship between plants and soil, which is that soil is the gut microbiome of a plant and plants signal to its gut microbiome what it needs. And a healthy soil system provides it. But a farmer who's using industrial methods will give the plant everything it needs and ignore the ecology of the soil and the benefits that it offers, both nutrient benefits, immunological benefits, flavor profiles, all those things are informed by soil. They will ignore that and just give it what it needs. So the plant kind of dumbs down and becomes dependent, like a 25-year-old child that won't move out of the house after going to college. And so the the organic method that we've we've have slowly derived, I guess, since the 70s, doesn't look at soil health, but what it does do is say, let's stop spraying these 
synthetically derived chemicals that destroy other beneficial organisms on a farm, be it other predator pests or predator species of insects that may balance pest insect species or other things that may destroy soil systems. But organic doesn't really say, let's build and regenerate soil health and let's build and regenerate the biodiversity above the ground as well. Because all of these things, when we talk about biodiversity, various uh, funguses and bacteria and pests and other wildlife, they provide ecosystem services to the planet, but ecosystem services directly to a farm. So the regenerative model or biodynamics or permaculture or holistic, really the similarity in all of those is that it's about, first and foremost, you must look at the health of the soil as number one. And how do you build soil health? Well, you can't build it unless it's covered. It has to be covered with plants. Plants are what build soil. Plants are what pump liquefied carbonic sugars directly into the soil to feed microorganisms, to turn that immune system on all the things that help inform the health of the plant. So really what we're talking about in regenerative agriculture is really a system that does the opposite of the extractive model of industrial agriculture, where it just robs soil of its nutrients and its ability to act independently and regenerates it. It's a lot easier to start a regenerative farm on a piece of land that has not been extractively farmed like Apricot Lane Farms was for 45 years. So we essentially inherited or bought a piece of land that was a robbed bank. And if you're going to open the bank up for business the next day, you can't open it up without putting something back. So we are reinvesting in what we have divested in. The cool thing is that what we've noticed and what you saw if you saw the film is that just simply that consciousness for that is able to restore and show the resistance of these these very complex systems, it's able to restore it in a much shorter period of time than the time it took to destroy it. So it took 45 years to destroy it, but within eight years, we turned it back into something better than what it was just because we were conscious of its needs from a consequential perspective. And I think it's so important that on your journey, and you document it through the film, that you're coming from that ground zero, a place where you can't even bury a shovel an inch into the soil, and you're showing people and, and showing them the optimism that you can come from, you know, the worst of the worst. And within this period of, you know, eight to 10 years, you can build, you know, total, beautiful, regenerative farm. Well, that was naive yeah. idealism led really by Molly's eternal optimistic view on life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm reading this, John will roll his eyes because I've been talking about this book so much, but I've been, I'm reading this really great book called Humankind right now. And in it, there's a quote that I love so much. And it, it talks about how not only problems, but solutions can multiply exponentially. And I felt like that it just summarizes so much of what we need right now and um, what we saw happen. Like you can't convert, like a, a lot of times people say, well, you know, I want to try to convince my mom or dad to change our farm to regenerative methods. And I'm like, well, how do they view it? And they're like, oh, well, they don't think it works. And I'm like, then you'll never change them. You can't change people and convince people to care about the climate or to care about food or care about diet by using fear as a tactic. We've tried that for years with the climate debate. And, you know, fear only force only creates a polarization in two different groups. And it forces people to sort of squint their eyes and look away. What we need is to figure out what is the method that you get people to open their eyes and discover on their own. And the way that you do that, that we've learned, is through affinity. They have to fall in love with something. They have to see it through a different lens. And once they love it, they begin to want to protect it because they value the context, the reasons that it exists. Like for us, I think that's probably been the most important thing in opening people up this, to this idea is not to try to scare them into believing in it, but just show them how everything is connected together. And that interconnectedness registers as them as purpose and meaning that they can relate to. And now they love it and want to protect it and fall in love with it. And then they discover a whole bunch of other things through that process. They understand the connection to their gut microbiome because soil is the same thing. They understand the connection to ecosystems and climate change and this radical response we're seeing from the ecosystem's immune system trying to regulate things. And uh, suddenly it sort of puts together all the stories into one, but it all turns on affection. 
And let's come back to the early days. So do you guys still remember the day or the conversation when you guys said, yes, we're in 100% and you were going to make the big shift? Well, it was kind of an evolution because we had the, you know, we had something we wanted and then we had, we found a person who was possibly interested in enabling this to happen on a much bigger scale. And so I think throughout all of that, we were kind of deer in a headlights, like, could this possibly be real? Could this possibly happen? And so it, you know, it wasn't even any turning back then. You're just, you know, we found the land and then the land ended up getting purchased. And then here we were. I mean, I remember at that point, John was having to be in Chicago. Yeah, I was still, I was in South Africa and I was still doing some docu-series work. It happened so quickly that I hadn't yet fully exited you know, my prior career. No, but I mean, like before it happened, we had to be up in Chicago for a little while. So we were flying back and forth to even make the the, the exchange happen. I remember the moment, the moment we knew it was going to happen was when we walked on this piece of property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were always like dabbling with this idea of like, all right, let's go visit these properties. And then we visited this one and we were like, we both looked, we weren't even in the gate. Yeah. This place. We, we, we were outside the gate. We both looked at each other and this is how easily convinced we were. We're like, did you just hear that B? <laughs> and we both said, we got to make this happen. <laughs> it was beautiful. It had rolling hills and old growth trees. I mean, to us, it was beautiful. But when we got to understand it more, it needed a lot of work. But it, you, you saw the potential that yeah. this place had. And because they had left some old growth trees there, which is very unusual, it to us felt like the place you could create more biodiversity from. Yeah. It had a on, though yeah. it needed help. It had orchards. It had a space we could put a garden. It had a, pond <laughs> and a lot of help. And it had a well, the place that we put the garden eventually uh, was actually a horse arena that was full of sand. And we yeah. were like, that's a perfect place for a garden. <laughs> we didn't realize how much we had to convert a sand lot into actual soil, which took, you know, every bit of five years. We were the actual definition of rose colored glasses. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it. Yeah. And sometimes it takes that. I mean, if yeah. you guys hypothetically would have known what it was going to take on that first day before you put the money down. Would have never done do you it. think you would have been able to do it? No, not if we'd really known. Yeah, I don't know. Someone but listed all that off. I Here's don't, stuff I don't do know. I might have still done it. I've been like, hell no. <laughs> but uh, the two things we were at least did have foresight. We were thinking about just from our kind of freelance backgrounds of having to make things work. We were thinking about, is there a market? And we knew that there was LA within reach, there was Santa Barbara within reach. And then we thought about water and making sure that there was a good water source. So those were pretty good. We could have gotten in some serious trouble had we not thought through those things. But aside from that, slippery slope after those two. (laughs) The naive part was just not really truly knowing how to make the change that the land needed. We did value the fact that, look, most farms that do this are probably three hours from the consumer base that would support them. And for a farm like this to survive, it's 100% required that you are selling as direct as possible. You make three times more money and you can't find packing facilities for rare fruits that you grow in a county that only grows avocados and lemons. They're only packing facilities for avocados and lemons. So you have to create the market. And so being within an hour of Santa Barbara and LA is a pretty special and unique opportunity. And most farms around here, I would say 99.9% of them are not organic and they're growing monocrop, either avocados, lemons, strawberries, or blueberries is predominantly what's grown. Well, speaking of avocado and lemon, that's what was previously grown on your farm. Yeah, right. It was mainly a lemon farm and, and slightly avocado. We put in a bunch more avocados, but we put in a variety a bunch. Yeah. A bunch of varieties of avocados. We have 15 varieties of avocados now. So we have an area we call the avocado conservation area because it's 14 out of the 15 varieties. There are ones that you can't really grow very easily commercially. And you can't ship them very easily commercially. No, the That's skins are a little grown. softer. And they ripen during a time of the year when the competition with you know, the foreign and like the, the fruit coming up from Mexico is released to the States and it becomes really impossible to compete with it on the open market. So if you have a direct consumer relationship, they're willing to pay the price. But if we had to sell that fruit through that market, it would, you know, it would never work because of the competition from outside 
uh, the country. And what changes, you know, you guys have been in this for over a decade now. What changes have you noticed in the consumer market over that period of time, going to farmers markets and people understanding, you know, different varieties, like you say, of avocados and, and these specialty fruits and vegetables? Are people becoming more aware, like from your own eyes? Yeah, I do think uh, because thankfully we're in a market where there is a consumer base that is interested, we thankfully have always been able to sell what we grow. There has always been a market for what we're willing to put out there. But I do think that the level of intrigue or just connection to food has definitely been increasing. I mean, we the amount of truly wonderful human beings that we've met through John's film that went out that have deep interest in seeing change. And I certainly know in the arc of my career, just from, you know, the twenties being, or me in the twenties, which would have been, I don't know what that was. <laughs> I don't know. I can't do the math, but um, there was, there's been, you know, a, a dramatic difference of what was commonplace back then compared to what is more commonplace now. So what's day one on the farm look like? You guys now own the property. You're going to begin this new venture. Obviously, there's a lot of learning ahead. Well, first of all, what, what did you do once you knew you were committing to this? What kind of books and resources did you dig into to learn where you're going to go with it? And then talk about day one and what that looked like. I think we knew in starting that we wanted to be organic. But then um, in looking into organic, we saw that really it's though a wonderful thing, you know, a great step in the right direction. It's really kind of you can't use this pesticide chemical based uh, synthetic pesticide, but you can use this. And so it's just a substitution. It wasn't stimulating enough to um, be inspiring a lifetime. And so we kept looking and we found the Demeter organization, which is a biodynamic certification. And so that was a first step for us as far as finding them. And through them, we found our mentor, Alan York, which was a big step in the right direction. He had uh, a practical application of his knowledge that was really special. And uh, he would leave us, he'd come and work with us and then leave us with um, a document that had like to do's. And that was our Bible, man. We would like, you know, and it was hard. It was like six pages long and we had to like do all this stuff. And, and he kept us focused. I can remember one of the first trips he had. I remember we had something passed or something in this little garden we had started that wasn't even our garden that we have now. And I was like, Alan, can you come over here and just look at this? And he was like, Molly. I got to keep you focused on bigger. We got to focus on bigger. And he wouldn't even look at it because he was like, we got to stay in the big picture. So like, I don't think we just wanted to be organic. We knew we wanted to integrate animals into a system. We knew we wanted oh, to Oh, definitely. Yes. Wildlife. But as far as I guess I was describing just the certification search. Yeah, but, but yes. like as far as like the search of like who was going to influence that, I remember sitting on the couch in Santa Monica, randomly calling farmers that were doing stuff like great, you know, doing planned grazing, managed grazing with sheep and cows in crop systems. And I would call them and I would talk to them for like an hour and a half, three hours. I got lucky and they just would, and I was always, I was always used to like the film industry. If I tried to call someone for advice, they'd like never take your call, let alone probably give you time. But the farmers I was calling because they weren't published farmers, they were just guys, you know, doing this stuff. They were willing to share a lot of information. And so that gave me a sense of confidence that, oh, this is possible when people do this. And then, you know, of course, we read books like, you know, from Joel Salton and stuff like that and started getting into like Alan Savory and then later Gabe Brown and this guy Ray Archuleta and all these other sort of pioneers and sort of the messaging of this, the lifestyle and the messaging of this stuff. And then we hired a whole host of like various consultants over the years, not a ton, but a few, and you would get these conflicting sort of like opinions about stuff. And you realize you're kind of on your own, <laughs> you know, yeah. you're just gonna have to pick directions. And then, you know, Molly was the one that really wanted to go down the road of biodynamics because it kind of brought all of it together. It was the only thing at the time. There wasn't a regenerative certification. Mm -mm. There wasn't a permaculture certification, although we weren't even going to do mainly permaculture anyway. We apply elements of it. And it was she, the only thing that taught ecosystem yeah, at that time. Yeah, and Alan really appreciated it. Like, and he, you know, would talk about barn owls and you know bringing predators back to the farm and the importance of that. And that you would see the return of that type of wildlife. It was purposeful by year five and seven. 
You know, he predicted all of those things. So no one else talked like that. They were like, I focus on grass pasture management. I focus on this. I focus. He was like a whole systems kind of thinker. And the crazy thing was, looking back, we did not know this at all. But when Alan passed, we were, I mean, honestly, angry. <laughs> we were like, holy cow, we just planted all this stuff. We have to figure this out. And we, and we were mourning his and- loss while being really frustrated and scared out of our mind that our, the guy that believed in us just died at the moment we would probably need him the most is what we thought. That's what we thought. But I think what we came to realize in the greater scheme of the universe is that we actually were at the point we were meant to fly on our own. Because even Alan, looking back, I can see that he had methodology that was amazing and taught us so much, yet he wasn't this land. And he could have never known this land the way that we know this land. And so it was time for the the baton to be passed to us. And we had to struggle for a couple of years to figure out what that meant and how to apply it. But ultimately, we found our way and everything then was really in house through the instincts of our people. That's what I always now, I mean, you find the people that are going to be on this journey with you that also love this land. And then you trust the instincts of what you have here, because they are the people that have their hands working that soil every day and are watching the birds and watching the, where the sun is. And that's who's going to know the answers. And Alan actually left the team at a relatively early point in the journey. Well, at least in the film's journey, was it year two or three? Year it was two. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Like late two, I think maybe. Yeah. Did you guys consider throwing in the towel or finding a replacement for him? Or how did that all unfold at the time? We tried to find replacements. There's no replacement. Yeah. yeah, there was nobody that we could have. At that point, we knew too much, <laughs> too. Yeah. So we would have never been satisfied. And there's really, there wasn't another Alan yeah. that he's just not, you can't manufacture that soul. That was a once in a lifetime. Yeah. But yeah. Um, we set up systems that were too complicated for any other consultant to factor in the value of at the time. Yeah. Someone might be an expert in compost, but they may not know anything about integration of animals and how to set all that up and the value of that. But we, we weren't ready to, I, I wasn't I, ever ready to throw in the I mean, towel. we argued about this constantly, like years three and four. It wasn't about quitting. It was about whether or not we were going to be destroyed, whether this was the end, whether this epidemic of this pest or of this weed. I mean, there it's not in the film, but we, we had at least, I don't know, how many acres? 35 acres of morning glory growing on the farm. The cover crop wasn't working fast enough. We had used a lot of this mulch from old trees to sort of put rings around the tree. And every single ring around the tree got covered in morning glory, which is a climbing vine, essentially. And it was climbing around our sprinklers and up and over top of avocado trees. We were spending so much energy on pulling this this crap off and every year, twice a year having to do this. And there were those times when we're like, what do we do? Like, how do we get out of these things? And You just start to find the rhythms and opportunities to intersect with the problem in a way that is maximizing the mutualistic benefit of both, you know, why that weed was there and what else could grow instead and just hitting things at the right time. And that's something that we would have relied on Alan so much that we wouldn't have developed our own compass and understanding and belief in ourselves to be able to stay calm enough in the wake of those incredible failures of an embarrassment to stay calm and awake and aware enough to be able to see. And so Alan dying essentially helped us turn on our own ability to see things in the way that you ultimately need to to farm in this way. Because really, at the end of the day, we always wondered when we would be able to call ourselves farmers. And I think maybe Molly would agree that it was really the moment that we realized that it wasn't about what you know, it's about your ability in the wake of failure to be able to observe your way through creative solutions with a level of humility and openness to how it may change the way you farm. And that's how you learn. You learn through those failures. And there was no one that could really teach us that. And that was essentially what Alan was always saying to us. But when he walked on the farm and he talks in that way, you're just like, well, what do I plant? I mean, yeah, yeah, I hear you. It's great. I understand the philosophy. But what should we plant here? Because you're just thinking, how can we make this work? And he's trying to say, no, you need to set it up with the lifestyle that you want to live. Because people say, well, how do I do what you did? I'm like, well, figure out what you like 
what type of animal, what type of plant, because you're going to be dealing with that thing. Like, again, like a 25 year old child that will never leave. You're never going to be without that thing. You better love it because you're going to have to nurture it in good times and in bad. So you have to find what, what aesthetically inspires you and gives you energy to want to persevere through those, those really tragic, difficult moments. Now I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with John and Molly to give a shout out to my show partner, Paleo Valley. Snack clean with Paleo Valley's 100% grass-fed beef sticks. Paleo Valley beef sticks are the only beef sticks in the USA made from 100% grass-fed, grass-finished beef and organic spices that are naturally fermented. Thanks to this fermentation process, each stick contains gut-friendly probiotics. They come in five flavors, original, jalapeno, which is my current favorite, summer sausage, garlic summer sausage, and teriyaki. And it's important to point out that 100% grass-fed beef is actually good for the environment. Conventionally raised grain-fed beef is terrible for the environment, but on the other hand, 100% grass-fed beef helps regenerate the soil and grasslands, which in turn helps pull carbon out of the atmosphere and puts it back in the soil where it belongs. And as a listener of the show, you get 15% off your Paleo Valley purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash paleovalley. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash paleo valley get yourself some of the paleo valley's 100 grass-fed beef sticks and start snacking clean now i'm going to give a shout out to my other show partner blue blocks still don't have a pair of blue light glasses blue blocks has you covered they make the best ones available if you're new to blue light glasses i recommend getting started with the sleep plus glasses they eliminate 100 percent of the blue and green light between 400 and 550 nanometers And this is the exact range that's been shown in clinical trials to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact our sleep. Sleep Plus glasses are to be worn two to three hours before bed and provide optimal results after just one evening's use. The Sleep Plus collection is available in non-prescription, prescription, prescription, and reading magnification options. And they come in an array of stylish frames, so you can find a pair that you love and that suits your style. As a listener of the show, you get 15% off by using my link, ultimahealthpodcast.com slash blueblocks. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash blueblocks. And blueblocks is spelled B-L-U-B-L-O-X. Start sleeping better with the Sleep Plus glasses from blueblocks. And now back to my chat with John and Molly. So the way it was portrayed in the film, Alan, he's there one minute, and then all of a sudden you guys couldn't really get a hold of him. You didn't have time to formulate any kind of plan of how to move forward. Then he passes away. So one moment you're getting so much help and the next moment you're disconnected. Yeah, it was a six month process from him not being able to show up for some unknown reason to then us finding out that it was it was more a health issue that he was facing that was terminal. And how long did it take before other people were coming onto the farm to help you guys out? How did that all unravel? Other people meaning... Like Staff other or... hands on the farm, you had oh, yeah. a lot of, it like looked like a lot of young them. people that were learning farming and, and had an interest in this way of farming that you guys were I essentially from... learning as you were going, but you were teaching them as well. Like how long did it take before you were able to draw an interest and bring people in to, to help out? I mean, almost nearly like the first year because... Yeah, it was December. The first year is when we had our first woofers. Yeah, we had uh, or first, November. Yeah, wor- these you know worldwide opportunities on organic farms. It's called the Wolf Program. And uh, we immediately signed up for that pretty pretty shortly after we started. And we had Raul and Flavio were, were our only full-time you know team members at that time. And then the rest was like between, gosh, five and nine wolfers at any given time, learning from two of the most inexperienced farmers they could have ever selected. But we, a lot of, a few of them are still here full-time and we've probably hired 25 of those volunteers over the number of years who now run the various departments on the farm. And that has been really how we did it because there, you, you couldn't find anytime you hired like local, you know, uh, farm support, they were very jaded with this idea of what a farm should be. And so to try to change the way they saw was incredibly draining. You just need people to be like, Oh, this is so cool. I want to do this. And we're willing to go through it with you. So, I mean, picking your team is really important. And Flavia and Raul were both incredibly supportive of it from go. But so were, of course, the young people that started with us. So I know chickens were a big interest for you specifically, Molly, in the beginning. And that was something that really took off for you guys in the beginning. 
how long did it take for you guys to decide on what the master layout was going to be of the farm and what you were going to incorporate in? Oh, gosh, it's an evolution. It's an evolution evolution. that's still evolving. But um, yeah, it it was, I mean, we were going to plant, we were trying to be very practical and we were going to plant this one big open block in avocados because that's a really good crop for the region. And it was a last minute change to plant a whole, we planted 75 different varieties of fruit trees, which became our fruit basket. But that was really driven because we uh, wanted to maximize flavor and again, do varieties that might not be commercial and then can go direct to consumer with that model. And that ended up working for us because the direct to consumer model is ex- exactly what we do. Aside from that, now we're really our uh, standards have shifted a little bit more even because we look for, you know, drought tolerant is something that we're um, more and more focused on. We recognize the reality of where we farm and that that's something that needs to be in consideration. So it makes us think outside the box with that. And then just what we're going to end up ultimately doing with our food, whether it be product lines and such. So that drives a bit of how we plant these days. But Currently, our block M is being converted over to, so that's where those 75 varieties are. Some of the varieties just, you know, you don't, they don't work as well as others. That's why there was so much variety to figure that out. So we're, um, our team has learned how to graft internally, which is when you are able to use that rootstock of one tree and be able to attach the variety that you want onto it. And then you're able to maximize the growth more quickly because you get all of that root growth that had already happened. So we're transitioning over a good number of varieties um, to have more of what does work. But yeah, it's it's the artist's palette in a most beautiful way of the earth. And so you're looking at it always from the bird's eye view and trying to figure out what needs to be there and listening. Listening is a big key. I I think the goal with every move is to do something that is logical and makes sense, but cultivates an aesthetic that inspires you. You know, just like the choice of animals and the choice of, of crops that you would grow. You want to create a schematic that is inspiring and exciting and beautiful because the cultivation of beauty is essentially the way biodiversity becomes the toolbox that you need to rely on. So the whole that's the cool thing that Alan always said is that you're not being selfish by making something beautiful. He's like, you're just maximizing the toolbox that you'll call on when trouble arrives. And I think for us, we were always also thinking about the aesthetics of the farm as that being as important as what we grow. And the aesthetics of what we provide to our customer. I mean, our egg boxes were our first kind of hit. And that really is kind of an artist palette when you open it up of chickens. Those, chi- I mean, it's just different colored eggs. Yeah, so just a yeah. beautiful rainbow of, of egg colors. And that's very intentional that we do. And there's an example. So then like they see the beauty of that, right? They're starting to ask questions and then they fall in love with the fact that, oh, those are different chickens. And now they understand, oh, the different chickens are heritage breeds and those heritage breeds are, are uh, less prone to uh, different diseases and know have in, in the uh, genetics and instinctual understanding of how to survive on a pasture in a more healthy way. And now they're fully sunk into the idea of what regenerative agriculture is because you pull them in with the visuals that would help them fall in love with it enough to ask deeper questions to get the science that you kind of want to start with in the beginning, but you can. It's all about love. Do you ever foresee that there'll be some kind of actual certification on packaging to say that something's regenerative ag? You know how we have organic and conventional now. It would be nice to see, you know, that this is done through permaculture or regenerative agriculture, is that something you can see coming down the pipe? The Patagonia, there is one, yeah. Yeah, Patagonia, uh, Dr. Bronner's National Science Foundation, and one other partner got together and started a new certification program called Regenerative Organic Certification. And Apricot Lane Farms was one of a handful of farms that piloted the program for a few years as they developed kind of the, essentially, the criteria. It's an international program, and we just became uh, one of the first farms in that piloting program to become certified regenerative organic. So now we're regenerative organic certified, biodynamic and organic certified. And so I think that is important to have a space 
that we are involved with that that is part of that certification. And I will say, I don't think certifications are the most important thing. I think tomorrow we could drop all of our certifications <clears throat> if we were good at telling our story to the customer, to engage them, to be able to make a, an educated decision about whether or not to support our farming methodologies. But certifications help bring a community of farms together and they help a public start to begin to understand what criteria are available for them to support. So I think certifications can be a blessing and a curse to farming systems because they're incredibly difficult to manage, but they bring a community together on both the farming side and the consumer side around a sort of set of ideas. Yes. And for us, it was just important as this new regenerative certification was being developed to just have a seat at the table to help try to create an understanding of what's possible for farmers. But I agree with John that the most important thing is that people know their farmers. That's really because lots of farmers can't even afford that. It's not even the the expense of the certification. It's the labor of the, the tracking and things with the certification. And it's difficult. Anytime you get into a certification, it's a one size fits all. And that can be challenging when you're dealing with your unique things on your farm that do have nuances to them. And it doesn't mean that you don't have consciousness and aren't making the best choices for that land. It's just really hard. And going forward, I think it's important that people don't, the reason I even brought all that up is to say that we, is to say that we don't want, we don't want to have people feel uh, or go shame other farms that aren't certified because they could be doing things as good, if not better than Apricolian farms, but they may have chosen to put their economic and very precious time resources towards basically just doing what's right rather than filling out paperwork. Exactly. So be really open to supporting the, you know, the nuances in the way people farm and whether they're certified or not. They still could be a very, very good farm making steps towards you know, where we all need to go from an agriculture and um, ecological perspective. Right. I guess where it becomes more important is when there isn't that connection with the farmer and yes. goods are being shipped across the country or even out of the country. And, you know, you're shopping more at supermarkets yeah, versus right, farmers course. markets. But in your case, obviously it's best to shop as local as possible and get to know your farmer. And I, I know you had mentioned that you guys had gotten the regenerative agriculture certification, but is that something you're actually like putting on the packaging so people can see that in the store? Yeah. So it's, we're going to create a sticker for it. It's difficult because of just the amount, you know, when every time you add something to in or change it, you have to like change your packaging and it all becomes very expensive, but we are going to do a sticker. So you will see it on certain, certain items, but it is something that we are. It'll be on our website. We just put out a social media post about it. We're very proud to be a part of it. And we're very proud of Patagonia for everything that they're doing to further regeneration and grateful to them for that effort. Let's talk about what happened with the other farmers in the area when you guys came in. How did they initially react at that time? Did they really even take notice or, you know, know what you guys were doing? And then now as things have evolved and obviously as the movie's out and and gained all kinds of momentum, how has that changed over time? I think initially they thought we were a hobby farm. We had that one meeting with uh, some farmers, and they. <laughs> I was I was very naive here. I'm like, yeah. I was I my that was you get everybody together, you make cookies, have some lemonade, well, we have a nice all chat. The far- <laughs> yeah, all the farm- farmers over that were within like a three mile radius. There was like thirty of them. We you know opened up our house, had them all over, and then we asked them if they wanted to walk around. And we had some infrastructure in place, like we were starting to do some things like composting. What point was this? How far into it was this? Probably a year or so in. And we said to them, do you all want to do a little tour around the farm and kind of see what we have going on? And one woman speaks up for the group and says, we don't need to take a tour of your farm. We're farmers. Okay. And we were like, okay. And then they left. (laughs) And and their comments were like, well, you're not going to feed the world with this way of farming. And I mean, it was pretty bad. They were not very welcoming. I think over time, what changed um, some of the, actually one of the individuals that said that exact line came back through around year five and was like, your trees look amazing. Uh, We planted them around the same time he planted some trees and ours were twice as big and we weren't spraying for things like thrips on the avocados. And he's like, how are you doing that? And tell me about the ducks and how are you dealing with your snails? And like, it was crazy because it was a complete about face. 
And then I've noticed a few other farms that are using cover crop and things like that, which is really important. I wouldn't say that we've turned it into like a regenerative mecca by any means, but I know that we have given voice and justification to the inkling of drive that others might have to think in this way based on the quality of the food and the the way certain trees on the farm are starting to look in comparison to our neighbors. That's something that I'm just reflecting on now with with regards to, because it is true that our avocados there looked so great and they came over and asked questions. And that's the unique thing. It's a very vulnerable thing to be a farmer in this way because you don't have things that put Band-Aids on things. So you quickly realize this works well, this doesn't work well. And because you can't cover it up with just adding, you know, more of whatever could make it grow and stuff. So it's, it's a very exposing method. It's a slow that, fix. Yeah. And that's what is true. I see with our staff too, because we have a, you know, we have a, a very open communication policy and people will say, oh, why, you know, people are grumbling or this or that's going on. And, and I always say, well, we're like the cut that is actually allowed to bleed and oof out. Like we don't have a bandaid on top of that. So you're going to hear what's going on, but you want to just like flush that out and let it go. Mm -hmm. And the farming is the same way. You're actually getting to see what's going on. If that's with your body, you know, your child, John and I's son, Bodhi had an eczema patch and the instinct is, okay, just put something on it, put some, even some zinc or something, make it go away. But then you don't know what the your body is trying to tell you. And I know I'm probably... You don't get to the root. Yeah. yeah, I'm preaching to the choir here. But those are your signals. That's what you actually want to be listening to. Well, we had lemon trees that were so... Our, the leaves and the lemon trees were so yellow, you couldn't tell the difference between a leaf and a lemon. <laughs> See, right. that's what and, I mean. <laughs> so we could fix it if we just put some more like synthetically derived amo- uh, uh, nitrogen on it in the form of ammonium nitrate, which, by the way, is thing that blew up in Beirut was ammonium nitrate. It, uh, we could have done that and turned those trees green quick, but it took several you know, seasons for us to gradually make that shift to where we balance out the nitrogen in the soil to get those trees to sort of be able to find that nitrogen in the first place. But, you know, so our neighbors would drive by and just shake their heads like, oh, these dreamers, you know? Yeah. It wasn't a quick fix. It was not a quick fix. No. But what, what did you do to balance out that nitrogen? How did you specifically in that case do that? Well, there's some organic methods that we can increase our nitrogen that we're giving it in the form of various manures, et cetera. But if you do it too quickly, you bring in pests. So that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing that's going on in agriculture, by the way. They add a lot of nitrogen and then that sort of metabolizes as like basically sugar available in the tree. And then all of a sudden the pests smell that and they're in there attacking it. And then now they're spraying for the pests. And at the same time that they're spraying for these pests because these trees are so green and beautiful they're killing all the other bees and then ladybugs and other sort of collateral damage that that could help mitigate those pest issues. Um, So then we we had to look at also how to do it slowly and also what was in the soil, what what cover crops were we using, were there enough legumes like clover, because clover has a relationship with a bacteria called rhizobia that lives in its root zone that actually turns atmospheric nitrogen that is free and available at like 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen but it can't be used by plants unless it gets converted by these these bacteria. And they would convert it in the root zone of the clover. And then as the sheep would come through and graze it and bite some of that clover off, the bottom portion of that plant, in order to regrow, would let some of that root zone die, which would have these nodules attached to it full of nitrogen, which would then now be decaying and leaking into the soil made available to the lemon tree. And so all those cycles combined bring about a level of health where you're not having to attack it just from on top. And we also really focus on um, micronutrient balance because oftentimes you're just focusing on nitrogen when really if you can balance out some of the other minerals that have a relationship, you're going to end up having the results that you need without just having to use nitrogen to get more growth. And then we also focus on foliarly applying to our trees because then with some of those micronutrients or other immune stimulating things like compost teas so that then we have the proper amount of photosynthesis so that our soils, the microbially rich soils that we have created then can actively work because the tree's cycle is functioning. Talk more about that compost tea. That was really interesting. You guys created a whole structure to bring in earthworms. And is it worm castings that you're that they're creating and that you're collecting to make the tea? 
There's two different types of compost that we do. One is windrow compost, which is we do about 700 tons a year, uh, which is essentially decaying, you know, manures and plant matter, so carbon nitrogen mix. Um, and then we have the worm bin, which is essentially the using the red wiggler worm to break down organic matter. And as it does, as it eats through this organic matter, it infuses in its casting, its poop, it's infused that casting with, you know, up to 48 different types of bacteria. So it is intensifying the bacterial load and microbial load of that soil to where now you have this essential tea ingredient that gets collected brewed in a tea, which is a basically a cold water tea with lots of oxygen. So it's an, an aerobic environment and enhances the density of that those microorganisms. And then that tea becomes this 500 gallons that gets either foliar sprayed, meaning sprayed to the leaves of the tree or injected into the irrigation system and what we call fertigated into the lower portion of the canopy of the tree. And you're putting all those warriors of fungus and bacteria and protozoa and nematodes back out onto the soil to help break down the decaying plant and animal matter, whether it be poop or leaves. And then that helps to release those nutrients that are in that decaying death of the former life. And that those nutrients get sprinkled down and fed to the root zones of trees. And part of that too is the nutrients can actually be absorbed through the leaves as well and put a, a probiotic microbiota on the plant. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're increasing surface competition on the leaf by just putting a foliar spray out to where that one fungal player that's doing damage now has a bunch of competition. But also plants are, I think it's like eight to 10 times more efficient at absorbing those micronutrients through the leaf zone than they are through the root zone. And you talk there real quickly about the life and death cycle. And this is obviously something that's really apparent throughout the movie, this theme of life and death and eventually death leading to new life. And we could really get on tangent and get into this. But as a farmer, this is something you need to quickly understand and embrace because it's not necessarily like you'd picture it where even if you're not, you know, incorporating animals for meat, there is still this whole life and death happening on the farm to produce what you're producing. Specifically, what do you? What, there's a couple of areas we could go there. I'm curious what what maybe you were. Well, I want to talk about first. Yeah, like we can talk about plant material and its decomposition and and leading to new life that way. But also, obviously, part of your system involves animals, which eventually are are converted, not converted, but they're processed and and made into meat that's consumed. And just some of the things that are coming onto the farm, pests, things like coyotes and, and different critters that you're dealing with, it was the groundhogs that were eating the roots of, of the trees. And, and there's so many different things in there that, that need to be handled and death is involved in the process. There's no denying that no matter how you go about doing it. I mean, there's a couple of ways to approach it, but one that, you know, impermanence is a requirement of life. And whether you're a vegan, a vegetarian, or a meat eater, um, none of what I'm about to say is to try to change the way you eat, but to share with you sort of the truth behind what happens with farming, even when we're growing just vegetables or fruit. So the understanding and being able to let go of and, and know that there is an impermanence of life that is required that ultimately is what's feeding life. Like we are nothing more as humans of a leather bag of old, you know, dead kittens and woolly mammoths and leaf litter. I mean, everything that is us passed through the soil system. Everything, every part of us passed through that soil system at one point or another, even if it came from the ocean, because that's the way it all sort of gets re-alchemized is through this top 20 or 12 inches of topsoil. I like to think of it as like people talk about the circle of life and trying to understand soil. And I think it's way more accurate to think of uh, life as an eight. And if you start at the center of that eight, the cross section and you go up, that's the birth stage. And as you come around to the top part and now you start to swing back down to the cross section, that is the death stage. And as it goes past the cross into the bottom part of the eight, that's the stage of decomposition. And as it comes back around now up towards that X again, that's the state of reanimation. And the X factor of our existence that's turning death back into life is soil. So soil being the X factor, 
and knowing that it is basically driving that impermanence to enforce or to fuel the existence of new life is a really important thing to understand. Second, people ask us a lot, can you farm this way without raising animals and using their manure and then having to harvest them? And before I answer that, I think it's important for anyone who's just, say, buying avocados or fruit from us to know that how do you value the life of a gopher or a cow, a ground squirrel or a bee? Because for us to grow the 200 or so acres of fruit on this farm requires us to kill at least 35 to 45,000 gophers every year and thousands of ground squirrels. And then accidentally, through even putting organically derived sprays out, we'll suffocate bees or a ladybug or butterflies. So if you eat, no matter what farm you buy from, you have blood on your hands. It's part of the process. Now, does it excuse the inhumane treatment of animals? Absolutely not. Do I or we, do we support CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations? Absolutely not. But, you know, having animals on the farm for the purposes of manure is a, a mutualistic um, symbiotic relationship that has evolved over billions of years that is ultimately how soil is made in the most healthy way, or you're required to use synthetically derived um, fertilizers. So we have cows on the farm, and what are we going to do once that cow starts to get old? Do we just let it die of natural causes? What happens is then we had our old bull Wesley. He started to get arthritic after about year nine. And I would love to let Wesley live forever, but he's now having a hard time keeping up with the rest of the herd. He can't stand anymore at times to get water. And so now I have to make a decision. Do I continue to go out there every single day and exhaust myself and the team to care for a geriatric animal that's on its way out? And now I've got another one, Firefly, my favorite cow starting to go down. And you suddenly have to make a decision about whether or not you're going to let the soil do the dirty work, because ultimately, if I put that animal in the soil, it's going to be repurposed and redistributed to the food I eat. Or am I going to make the conscious decision, be the good steward of that animal, create a humane and a quick death to turn that into energy so that I can maintain my life as a farmer and not be taken down by a hoarding situation of having too many animals in need of me beyond the needs of the farm? It's a difficult decision, but if we want to create healthy soil systems, it cannot be without animal input. How aware of that were you guys getting into this whole thing? And how much of it was a challenge for you in the beginning? And did it get any easier over time? I think it was hard to answer pointed questions, but we knew instinctively that we were doing the right thing, but we didn't understand how to get people to understand a way to see it, to create an appreciation for the nuance. We've become a culture of headlines where we think because we read a headline or one paragraph about something that we know. Molly and I both know for sure one thing, and that is we, we know absolutely nothing for sure. And the way we learn truth and the way we distinguish between right and wrong is by focusing on consequence. And consequences, especially in a farming system, are taught to you over time. And so to know the truth behind things, you must be able to have a capacity for context. And we don't have, and we have not raised a culture of people that have capacity to understand the complexities of the things that they want to judge as right and wrong. And there is no way you could say any one decision about the way a regenerative farm runs is simply right and wrong unless you understand the consequences of those decisions. The answers to the questions have evolved over time as we've been pressed to try to take a deeper look at ourselves and why we instinctually are driven towards a certain direction. And do you think being on the farm and having so much experience with new life and death, has that forced you in your own life to go deeper and you know focus in on your own mortality, would you say? Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I had just two comments on that. So I do think that probably the primary thing when people ask me, like I always love how I've heard that when people asked Obama what what was like the hardest thing about actually being president, he said, I, I didn't realize that by the time something got to my desk, it was like splitting hairs of things that you didn't want to have to make a decision. Like it was too, the lesser of two evils kind of thing, because all the easy, easy things would have already been taken somewhere else. 
but for my situation of being on the farm, the thing that I didn't know is the intimacy with grief. I think that that is something that you do get face to face with what grief is. You have to start to learn that cycle. You have experiences with it. And it's, it's incredibly, it takes you deeper for sure. And then for me coming into that decision with animals, I, because I had been that kind of unhealthy vegetarian for all those years, and then my body just did not take to meat. I ended up reading a like blood type diet book where it was an O type. And that was the first thing that was like, oh, maybe I need to actually start eating meat. And it was just immediate, the response to my body from adding back animal products into my, into my diet. And so I recognized that, you know, animals are something that I needed to be able to live my best life and everybody's different. So I don't know that everybody needs that, but mine certainly did. And so the humbling of rep- of recognizing that and then having to um, realize that, okay, if I'm going to eat animals, then I want to make sure that I am giving everything I possibly can to this animal before then I do eat it. And then I want to live my best life in honor of the thing that I ate. And I think that's like the spiritual side of the cycle of life that can raise us all up higher with the surrendering to that death, you know, creates life and that we can't really escape that no matter what our individual choices of diet are. Now I'm going to take another quick break from my chat with John and Molly to give a shout out to my show partner, Organifi. The Organifi green juice boosts your immunity and defenses and helps you detoxify with ease. It contains real superfood ingredients, including moringa, chlorella, spirulina, matcha green tea, wheatgrass, ashwagandha, and turmeric. To consume, all you do is mix a scoop of the powder with a glass of clean water, give it a shake or stir, and it's ready to drink. It's gluten-free, organic, vegan, soy-free, and keto-friendly. And as a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Organifi order by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that's ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Increase your immunity with the green juice powder from Organifi. And now back to my chat with John and Molly. Well, it's interesting coming back to how we opened the conversation, talking about Todd, you guys are animal lovers. And it was interesting, John, the way you chose to show, I think one of the coyotes in in the film, I don't know if it was the one that died when he ran into the water main or, or you had to, you know, end one because it was, you know, coming after the chickens. But the way you portrayed that, where you went to Todd's, you you kind of faded out on the coyote and faded in on Todd. It's interesting because those two animals are so similar, right? And and you guys are dog lovers. This is what it all. This is how everything came to be, right? And I'm the same. I'm I. You know, we have a dog, and it's a big part of my life. And I'm a meat eater too. I just I'm not attacking you guys in any way. I just want to have an open conversation and and. It's interesting because, you know, these are some of the thoughts that I have as somebody that consumes meat and loves animals as well. And I just like the way you portrayed that, John, come back to that, just like zooming under the coyote and zooming in on Todd, like very similar animals. And and one is looked at as a pest and the other is, is a love, you know, pet. Later on, we learn that the coyotes become part of the whole cycle that we're talking about here. And they're they become a, part of yeah. the farm working. Yeah, I just found that interesting with the the portrayal of of the coyote fading to your dog. There was a reason for that, and I'm I, I'm really interesting that you picked up on it. I didn't capture the moment that ultimately inspired why I did those two cuts side by you know, back to back. But when I shot the coyote, the one coyote that I ended up shooting, I walked up to it, and the thing that like immediately caught my eye was that the paw, the bottom of the paw of the coyote, looked exactly like Todd's. And I carried that image and that realization and this like heavy grief with me holding my gun, feeling like I had basically just abandoned, you know, our code of what we were not going to do, that we were, you know, I broke the harmony code. We're not going to live in harmony if now I got to shoot coyotes. And oh my God, they look just like Todd's foot. And that moment though, drove me to be like, I can't keep doing this. I have to figure out a way if there's a way to live with the coyote. And I have to dive deeper, more curiously into what the coyote offers to the ecosystem to justify the pain I know I'm going to put my team and the chickens through to get there because it's got to be, there's got to be more meaning tied to this. 
And that moment was important to symbolize the reality of what happened. And that, that's what drove me to want to figure it out was that I was like, I don't like that there should never be the inhumane treatment or lazy inconvenience factor behind why you kill an animal. Because inconvenience is ignorant of consequence, you know, and that's how we make a lot of decisions in our life until we realize there's consequences to that. So we should probably maybe look at the overlook the inconvenience part and actually start to do the work. And I think that it was just inconvenient and a nuisance to have coyotes on the farm. I had to figure out what the consequences were to not having them. And I think that's the interesting part about life too, that when you strip away that low hanging fruit and you are going after what you really want in life, you do get to a point where there is kind of a paradox where you're having to kind of look at yourself in this decision. And that's like the nature of life. It's kind of the reckoning of that sliver of space in between those two things where you learn from it and then grow. But you have to be kind of engaged in that learning and growing process. And if you're just kind of checked out and taking the easy answer, you might not have the opportunities to be able to to face those kind of things that provide the sandpaper to life. But let's look at that entirety thing a little bit more because it goes even further to what we were talking about before. It's so easy to say, oh, well, of course you shouldn't kill the coyote because the coyotes are going to ultimately help your gopher population and help your weasel population and ground squirrel population. They're going to mitigate all of that. Well, it's easy to say that, but until we had figured out a way for the coyote to stop killing chickens, while I was not killing all the coyotes that I should have been killing, in, in quotes, because my team is justifiably furious because I'm letting a hun- hundreds of more chickens die in the process. And so their point was, well, how is one coyote's life worth all of that? And I'm like, it's not. It's just the reality of the conundrum that I'm in. I will never learn the way if I give into it because I brought chickens here. That's on me. The coyote was already here. I have to figure out how to fit my system in as a secondary to his, if I can, before I take the convenient and perceived to be right path out of this. But I guess certain decisions require more immediate action. I know a big part of what you guys do is pause and, you know, take a step back and analyze the situation and see how it can fit into that cyclical, sure, you know, cycle of life. But in this case, you know, how many days can go by and how many chickens can die and you have to make the best choice at the time, right? Right. And yeah. every day you got to reevaluate that decision that may have been made in the haste and justifiably, you have to wake up tomorrow and be like, can I still justify that? Yeah. And that's where instinct, I think, comes in and trying to be as clear of a vessel as you can to be able to feel those instincts since since there are so many paradoxes. One of my favorite, you know, synchronicities or uh, cycle life examples, and John, you brought this up quickly earlier, was the ducks and the snails. I'd love for you to tell that story because the snails were decimating the trees. I think they were eating some of the ground crops as well. Who was it that had the epiphany that maybe we can bring in the birds? Uh, so the, 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 the snail, is a brown, it's called the brown snail, and it's a non-native pest of citrus, among other crops, and it eats the leaves of the trees, which destroys photosynthesis and makes, you know, destroys the plant's ability to make sweet tasting fruit. And the cover crop only made the snail population worse because they love moist conditions to be able to lay their eggs in. And so we had this massive outbreak of of snails. At the same time, we brought ducks in to try to raise duck eggs, and they were in the pond polluting it, essentially. And we had to remove the ducks from the pond. But right before that happened, we noticed that the ducks were eating snails around the edge of the pond where there was extra snails. And so we put them in under the lemon trees, and they, you know, in one season decimated over 96,000 snails easily. We did like these plot studies and we would count the number of snails in like a four by four section before and after the ducks came through. And we did that in multiple locations and sort of did a mathematical equation to come up with this figure. But then we ended up from that getting the derivative benefits were that the manure of the duck poop or the duck poop nitrogen level is incredibly high. And so it was fertilizing the trees and the flavor profile and nutrient density of the eggs of those ducks obviously went through the roof because they're now eating these very like well-informed ground living soil living species and eating that and turning that into 
nutrient rich, flavorful duck eggs. So like we started realizing that every solution can ultimately have multiple benefits, but at the same time, every solution to a problem requires more than one solution. Like that's the whole way that the ecosystem works. Like humans work like this. Well, you got a problem with, you know, in war, we're like, well, we got a problem with that country. We're going to, we're going to bomb them, you know, but diplomacy has taught us that, well, you kind of go at it from multiple different angles without having to use the thing that destroys everything. And so in regenerative agriculture, there's not a one solution for one problem. You have to go with all these little soft approaches. I, I like to say that it's like, if you're a regenerative farmer and someone breaks into your house, you're going to have to kill that person with a hundred Nerf bats because you, you, can, you can't just use one device. You're going to have to use a lot of different things that softly sort of take the wind out of the problem that's trying to maybe kill you or your farm. Who was it that came up with the idea to bring the ducks in? I don't remember, it sort of evolved and we may have even heard of it from other farms, but not believed it was possible, which is a lot of how all this stuff goes. You hear about stuff and then suddenly you find yourself with your back against the wall and you're like, you know, well, there was that one guy that said, if we buy geese, they'll, the geese will eat morning glory, which we did, by the way. And we finally bought geese. So it was probably something we heard, but didn't believe until you really were desperate. Like Alan told us from day one, you should put barn owl boxes up. But I'm like, why? He's like, because they'll eat gophers. And I'm like, well, we don't have a gopher problem. What's next? You know, I didn't say it to him to his face, but I'm thinking in my head, discounting his his very wise suggestion was like, get ready now. Preemptive health care is your way. And you're going to be sorry you didn't do it. And he was right. I was sorry because it took several years for the barn owls to then show up, even though the boxes were there. But the problem already was way far down the road with gophers. One thing I thought of when I was watching that scene with the ducks coming in and eating the snails, do they fully digest the shells? Yeah, they eat the whole thing. I guess No, I saw them eat the whole thing, but do the shells digest in their stomach? I guess. I mean, it doesn't come out as crushed up shell. I mean, I think they basically mince that down and, and suck the calcium out of, it, out of it and make these incredibly hard shelled duck eggs. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. And it's interesting as we're talking about all this, the, you know, the cycle of life and how everything fits. Has there ever been anything out there, a specific animal or pest that you haven't been able to find a solution for as of yet? I mean, ground, ground squirrels. Right yeah. Now. I mean, we've chipped away at ground squirrels and gophers, but those are still Go hard things. Gophers are better, but ground squirrels, because gophers have now at least five to six known predators on yeah. the farm. Weasels, badgers, gopher snakes, coyotes, hawks, either red tail or red shoulder, that's five. and then egrets. There's an egret we call George who comes back every year for three to four months when he's not up at his rookery having, you know, babies or whatever. He comes down, hangs out in our pond. And then just this last year, we notice he's out in the pastures harpooning gophers with his beak and yeah. eating them whole, which is insane, like a snake. It's crazy. But with ground squirrels, they're so vicious that hawks don't like to grab them as the first choice because they'll, they chew up, you know, they'll attack the leg of the hawk. So it's something that we've had to actually do a lot more trapping for than we'd, than we'd like. My, our dog, Blue, caught one, but he's chased a thousand and he caught one yesterday. We uh, are very proud. We were very proud. He was very shocked and we were proud. But yes. I would say that's one that we're scratching our heads with now because they're doing a lot of damage to the root zones of trees. Well, it's interesting too, because in nature, it seems like everything does come into balance if humans step out of the way and let it happen. But in the case of farming, you know, you guys have your impact and then you're bringing animals in and planting crops. So it becomes a non-natural situation. So there's going to be non-natural pests and things that occur. You have to account for the human and, and everything we're bringing into it, the influence. So I could see how that could make a pest or a situation that wouldn't have a remedy that would naturally work its way out in nature. Yeah, sure. I think we definitely the human element, like you're we throw as much of a wrench into things, if not more than anybody else. <laughs> yeah, like we bring the non-native pests to the farm yeah. sometimes, you know, like, I mean, just, just for example, like Asian citrus psyllid, known as ACP, is a pest that attacks citrus trees and carries with it in its gut the HLB virus, which is causes the trees to essentially not be able to ripen their own fruit and then eventually die. It wiped out about 50% of the citrus industry in Florida before they got a hold of what this thing was. That is a non-native pest. 
there are not a lot of predators of that pest. Now, ladybugs will eat the nymphs at the nymph stage of that pest, but we had to bring in the local um, CDFA, uh, had to bring in Tamarixia, which is a parasitoid that's non-native to the area to attack and try to balance out this other non-native pest. So a lot of times farming, even when done with the best of intentions and even regenerative or eco-restorative farmers can do more damage than good. But that's how we actually learn how the ecosystem works. You don't learn about it through knowing it and understanding and doing the right thing first. You basically accidentally hit a button that suddenly throws everything out of whack. And then you realize the value of the button that you destroyed. Like when Robert Payne was, who's a scientist who sort of created or, or did the initial study to prove that there are keystone species players that are vital to various ecosystems working. And without that keystone player, the entire system collapses. He was removing various sea creatures from these tidal pools in Northern California. And he tried removing like, you know, a mussel or a sea anemone and nothing would happen. It would remain stable. And then he removed the starfish and the entire system collapsed. So it wasn't until the failure that he was able to understand the value of something. So I think we need to be very, very aware of as a society that failure is the ultimate opportunity for us to glean the lessons for how it all works. We then now have to lean into that and know that that is the opportunity for us to make a change. That makes sense. And Molly, now that things have been in full development for a number of years and you guys are producing all this amazing produce, part of what got you, or actually what got you inspired and passionate about having a farm was having all this produce to work with in the kitchen. So how fun has that been for you? I know in the movie, it doesn't come back to showing you really working with the produce and stuff, but has that been a dream come true? Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I mean, you're talking to me at the right time of the year too, because right now the garden is just exploding. And I really am so proud from a culinary perspective of what we've done because our food is truly, I can just say our food is so good that whenever I eat that food, I'm almost like my palate is shifted to what that is. So I'm competing against ourselves in here. And then I go and I try something else and I can just feel this dramatic difference. But right now, currently like our cucumbers and our eggplants, I literally was cutting up an eggplant the other night. We were having a pizza night. I ate it raw, which I don't usually eat eggplant raw. And it was sweet. And I was like, what the heck is going on? So I tried to get another. And I, I was like handing it out to my family and be like, here, try this, try this. And it was, we just have gotten to the point that we're getting some sweetness in our eggplant and our cucumbers are so, the flesh of it is so dense. And just our lemons, when we got here, they were on the trees, they were just had tons of seeds and stuff. And the flavor was like salty almost. Yeah, and yeah. And now um, the it's just like this beautiful lemon flavor. And then it's like a normal amount of seeds that you would want within a lemon. And you can just see the changes take place. So I love it. And I'm actually to the point now where um, I wasn't going to do this, but I had the right team where it ended up coming together kind of a bit magically that I wasn't expecting to be able to do a cookbook. So with my culinary team here, we do have one that'll come out in fall 2022. So we're a ways out, but we'll have the Apricot Lane Farms cookbook. And it's reflective of the culinary journey that we've taken here because we've always had a culinary team that I've been working with on the farm that we feed our um, volunteer program and a rotation of our staff. But then we've been able to play with this different food that we have. And now we'll be able to share kind of what we've done with the, the greater world. So we're excited about that. That's so exciting. Congrats on that. And it's Thank interesting you. as consumers, a lot of times we're thinking about the calories we're getting from food or the taste, but there's also the nutrient density coming back to that again, where the foods you guys are producing, if you want to consider it dollar for dollar, if you're buying, you know, your eggplant versus some conventional eggplant, I don't know if you guys have any research on, on nutrient density differences. We do. Actually. We're basically looking for calories, nutrients. We want to avoid getting pesticides and other chemicals on the crops and ingesting those. And we want good taste. Off the top of my head, that's what I'm thinking about. So 
nobody's ever talking about nutrient density and dollar for dollar. What are you getting through using that eggplant example? I think there's a couple of things that like that we've evolved to understand the value of. One is the nutrient density of food. And just first of all, like the way we view life is through essentially the state of how we feel. If we're feeling happy, our mood is good. We have, you know, proper levels of, you know, dopamine squirting through our brain. Then we are uh, viewing our existence as content. And that contentment comes from the manufacturing of essentially, you know, like what I said, the dopamine. One of the things I like to, I have it written down here because it's something I kind of finally put together. And I know people know this, but in our gut, there's a hundred million neurons connected directly to our brain. And 90% of the serotonin that is produced by our body is produced in our gut and only 10% in the brain. And I think it's roughly 50% of the actual dopamine is produced in the in the brain, the rest is produced in the gut. So what you put in your gut really matters. It obviously is also supporting your, you know, your immune system and how your body is breaking down that food, but also the nutrients that are in the food that you're breaking down. So you want to put the best rocket fuel possible in that stomach for health reasons, for psychological and phys- physical health reasons. And so when we look at like the nutrient profile of the food we're growing and how soil informs that. We learned the most when we did a five-year study on our eggs. So we had our, our pasture birds cruising across these pastures that we were slowly restoring. You know, Every year, these pastures were looking better and better, getting more diverse. The soil was getting better. The organic matter in the soil had increased in like the first seven years by about 3 to 4%, which is incredibly high for that increase. We did an egg um, study that started year one looked at the egg nutrient analysis. And then by year five, we saw this like increase in lutein, vitamin A, the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio had increased. And the only thing that had changed in that five-year time wasn't the feed that we were giving the chickens. It was the same feed from Modesto Milling, an organic ration, but 50% of their diet was coming from what they were eating in the pasture. And so bugs, worms, and of course, grass itself is informed by the health, the nutrient availability that exists within soil. And that was being passed on through the chicken to the egg, to the consumer who buys that egg. And so that was really proof for us that we were seeing a return on the investment in the soil that we were making. And preemptive healthcare for our animals starts with how and what we feed them and where they are before we look at the husbandry that's required to fix problems that were ignorant of the preemptive opportunities that we had to change history. And so for us, nutrient density in the food and the flavor profiles is everything to why we do what we do, because it just makes Molly a lot happier in the kitchen. Yay! <laughs> and, and us healthier and, and the way we see life a lot better. This life isn't easy. You know, I think it's incredibly difficult. We're, we're really, I think, under a lot of stress most of the time. <laughs> but it's so much more fun and feels so much more meaningful because we are connected to this purpose that is driven by our understanding that, you know, the health of our bodies and the way we feel is informed by the work that we do every single day on the soil system that we support. That's so beautiful. And guys, I really enjoyed this conversation, covered a lot of ground here. But before I let you go, anything else you want to share with the audience? Any final thoughts? In our country, United States, we're experiencing quite possibly purposeful polarization, but a polarization that is ignoring the ways out of what we are polarized over. And we are feeling as a culture that in order to make change, that our only options are to speak up and fight against the opposing side to bring about that change that we hope to see. And when in actuality, what we need right now is less confrontation and more of the innovation that is required to solve these very complex problems. Because without the innovation of a collaborative spirit of both sides looking towards that as a solution, we are missing the diversity, the diverse way of thinking and problem solving that is required for us as a human species to find 
a closer, more aligned coexistence with the very important, diverse, natural world that we are completely dependent upon. And so what I want to say is that if you feel like you're not doing enough because you're not out there in a confrontational way, marching against or for what you believe in, and you're a creative thinker, then your innovative tools and gifts are what we really need. So if you aren't really, really creative and you're not a smart systems thinker, great, make a sign and protest. But if you are a creative thinker and an innovator, create and innovate what not just our country needs, but that's what the entire planet needs right now. Love it. Molly, do you want to add to that? For me, it just comes down to I find my peace in the connection with the earth and um, just getting closer to her with the food that I'm eating and time spent and nature right now is we always love to say how nature is very open right now, even though other things have to be closed and um, just going and finding solace in that. That's not only going to lead you to the answers that the earth needs, but it's also also going to lead you to a much more delicious dinner. <laughs> All right. And we'll look forward to your cookbook coming out in 2022. Thank you. Other than that, how can listeners connect with you guys after the show? Uh, we're pretty active with storytelling on Instagram at Apricot Lane Farms and Facebook at apricotlanefarms.com. Uh, and we stay pretty active with sharing some of our the highs and lows of our experience uh, with our um, supporters. The ebbs and flows. Yeah. Thank you so much. For yes. Thank you. It's fun. Yeah, be a part of it. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed the conversation. Really enjoyed the film. And you guys are doing so much good in the world. And thank you. Just keep doing what you're doing. Thank you uh, so much. Take care. Take care. I really enjoyed that conversation with John and Molly. It was really fun having two guests on the show. And I just learned a lot and really enjoyed chatting with them. I hope you loved it as well. And I'd love to hear what you thought of the episode over on Instagram. You can tag Ultimate Health Podcast and Apricot Lane Farms. And you can take a screenshot of the player as you're listening to the show. Take a short video of yourself or take a picture. And we'd love to connect with you over there. For full show notes, head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 370. There's links there to everything we discussed today and so much more. So be sure and check that out. And before I let you go, I want to give some love to my editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, thank you so much for all you do. It's much appreciated. And this week's fun fact is that we got ourselves a composter. And this is very fitting with the farming theme of today's episode. And with all the organic produce we go through, it's going to produce some amazing compost, which we can use on our gardens next year. Can't wait. Have an awesome week. Talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.